Okay, so we are live on Facebook as well as in Zoom. I will go ahead and uh, read your introduction here real quick. Um, for anyone tuning in on Facebook Live, um, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Leighton Shell, Director of the State Need Forestry Public Library District, and we have a special program for you here tonight. Um, we have Clarence Goodman back. He was just here recently with a fantastic uh, Dillinger program not too long ago. And uh, today we have uh, a great program on the Great War and the Great Migration. Uh, Clarence Goodman is a self-styled entertainer and historian whose actual and literal travels have taken him all over the map and all over the place. His love for his hometown and his eventual return to it have proven to be a blessing as his efforts have made him a favorite of libraries, historical societies, radio, television, and film. And he joins us today with one of his more than 30 Chicago-centric topics. So I will turn it back over to you then, uh, Mr. Goodman. Thank you for joining us again today. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Good evening, Leighton. And thanks so much for your um, that brilliant introduction <laughs> you just gave me. It sounds like as if I wrote that myself. Um, good evening, everybody. And welcome. Zoom casting to you from the snow globe that is Western Cook County and the Sears Roebuck 1921 house. I am Clarence Goodman and thanks for joining Leighton and myself and everyone else with the wonderful Stickney Forest View Public Library for tonight's uh, little clam bake where we're going to discuss the great migration and the great war engines of change where we're going to break down not only some of the components of the Great Migration and obviously the Great War, World War I, but how these things generated or these things came about during a time of progress, which led, <clears throat> excuse me, to conflict, which leads, of course, and led, of course, to progress again. And I hope you find this, uh, this program as interesting um, as I found it as I was researching it several years ago. This is another chapter of American Narratives. So if you are out there in the world, please silence your phones because you don't want to miss a syllable <laughs> of this. I'm cracking myself up already and it's early. And also hang on to your questions and comments till the very end and we'll have a little, uh, oh, I don't know, town hall <laughs> about everything. All of the images, my friends, I'm using as always within the fair use parameters of the American copyright law. I can't stop smiling for I am my parents' second favorite child, Clarence Goodman, and here we go. A Little bit of a backstory, obviously, with regard to the 19th century, we have the issues of slavery begetting, the issue of the Civil War begetting the, pro the Emancipation Proclamation and the freedom of the enslaved people, and then the sadly aborted, I shouldn't say aborted, but truncated reconstruction period, altered uh, reconstruction period with the assassination of President Lincoln, leading us into the election of 1876. And my friends, this is where we, we find the beginning of the shifting of the political parties. And that is going to play into our narratives uh, this evening. While all of this is going on, we have America embracing, shall we say, and thriving as a result of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution uh, arrived in London and in Paris and other European cities a uh, good 25 years before it got here. But when it arrived here, it uh, brought the drinks, it brought the snacks, it brought its stereo system and changed our country forever because this leads us into the Gilded Age and no nation on this earth embraced the Gilded Age or even had a Gilded Age like we did in the United States, the industrialists taking over the joint. And this coincides with the United States becoming a world power with the advent of the Spanish-American War, which is leading us to the very end of the Gilded Age and around the turn of the last century. At around this time, domestically, we had the era of Jim Crow really coming into full bloom. And many people don't understand what the Jim Crow era was. It was the backlash against the original construction and the original um, drafting, if you will, of the Reconstruction era. And so for a myriad of reasons, the Southerners left there after the war 
scapegoated and took things out on African Americans. And though we were free, we were marginalized to a point where we were barely, barely, barely transcending uh, and, and getting away from the, the, the advent of slavery. And this, of course, led to so many instances of violence. And this takes us to our narrative. One of the things uh, with regard to conflict that we have in this country and with regard to our narrative this evening, my friends, is the conflict of or the dividing of voices and views in the African-American experience. We've always had this. We will always have this. Back around the turn of the century, so 122 years ago, we had primarily two voices. One was led by this gentleman here, Mr. Booker T. Washington, a very, very lettered and accomplished gentleman, the Tuskegee Institute and so forth. His was a vision and a voice of prudence. His was a vision and a voice of one step at a time. We can't move too quickly. If you will, a very, very gradual tectonic pace with regard to the, to the ultimate emancipation of black and brown people in this country. And then the other voice, <laughs> led by Mr. Frederick Douglass, one of the most accomplished men of his era, a former slave. This gentleman is uh, really a man who needs no introduction. So I'll just cut it to this. This man led the opposite side of the aisle with regard to the black experience and black voices 122 years ago. Hello, Avon calling. Um, his was tectonic this. I got your tectonic speed for you right now. We want our freedom now. We want it today. And so we already have these two voices going against one another 122 years ago at around the turn of the last century. Keep that in mind, if you please. Playing a factor into our narrative is also the underrated and underappreciated Chicago Defender. As Chicagoans, you've all heard of the Chicago Defender, but if any of you out there who are under 50 years old, you have no idea how important the Chicago Defender was. First as a weekly newsletter, then a weekly newspaper, and then finally a daily newspaper, the definitive voice of the black experience in the United States. That is Mr. Robert Abbott on the left there, this visionary and this priceless person with regard to African-American history and the American experience. The, the Chicago Defender is coming into its own at about the time during our narrative. And one of the things that Mr. Abbott did was he utilized another Chicago original. You're looking at a group of some of the 10,000 black men called George, as it were, the Pullman Porters, the Brotherhood of the Pullman Porters, located primarily here in Chicago, based here in Chicago. Robert Abbott saw these gentlemen and ladies, the Pullman mates, as an opportunity. These people were going all over the country with their work. And his newspaper was growing, but not nearly as fast as he wanted to. Not just circulation, but impact and influence. So he gave stacks and stacks and stacks of his newspapers to the Pullman porters going out on the road and said, hey man, here, sell these for me, keep 40% for yourself, bring me back the other 60%. And so the Chicago Defender becomes the first African-American periodical or newspaper with national distribution at a critical time in our nation's history and especially in the African-American experience. Another Chicago voice coming into the fray was the force of nature, the indomitable, the incredible, the timeless Miss Ida B. Wells. Look, everybody, I've got her on my t-shirt tonight. Ida B. Wells had recently moved to Chicago just in time to shake things up. And her work, her landmark work and her visionary work and her pioneering work in the spirit of civil dis disobedience and so forth resonates to this day. She gets to Chicago and this natural writer, this lettered woman who has so much energy and so much to give with regard to freedom and equality and equity, she meets and marries the second most important African-American newspaper man in Chicago, gentleman by the name of Ferdinand Barnett. And so not only do you have a writer and a person with a typewriter or at least a, a printing press getting married, but you have arguably the first African-American power couple, perhaps in the American experience, certainly in Chicago. We're rolling right along. And so 
1901 is significant because the gentleman on the right, Teddy Roosevelt, via the, assassin the assassination of William McKinley, becomes the president of the United States. And if you know anything about Teddy Roosevelt, you know that when, they, when, they, when he was done, they broke the mold up in heaven because he and Thomas Jefferson were two of our most singular presidents. Teddy Roosevelt was a visionary and Teddy Roosevelt was a dyed in the wool Republican of the old school way. That is the party of Abraham Lincoln. And one of the things that Teddy Roosevelt wanted to do was make his party even more progressive. As he felt the pushback of Republicanism in the South, he wanted to do things more for the environment and more for every working man and woman in the United States. And one of the things he did to symbolize this was inviting Booker T. Washington to dinner in the White House. The hell that this man, the sitting president of the United States, caught for having an African-American as his honored guest in the White House was absolutely tremendous. And it made Teddy Roosevelt one of the most steadfast and stubborn sons of gun to ever be the president. It made him do a 180. And it made him tamp down and start to temper his fairly progressive policies when it came to race in this country. Because after all, he was a charter member of the party of Abraham Lincoln. And so with one hand, he was going to take um, on racial equality and, and take on being the champion for black and brown people. With the other, he was going to take on big business. After all the hell he caught for having Booker T. Washington to supper. He used both hands to take on business and kind of put racial equity and fairness and justice on the back burner and turned the flame way down. So an impactful thing happens in regard to this. Teddy Roosevelt, who could have run for another term in 1908, decides literally to ride off into the sunset as an old man of 49 years old. This was one of the most impactful events, certainly in the 20th century, but maybe in all of American history, because this changed the course of so many things. Oh, I would love to have a time machine and go back and, and you know, while not trying to have supper with President Roosevelt, uh, try to convince him to run again, because when he decided to retire from the presidency, his handpicked successor was William Toward Half. If William Howard Taft. Thank you. Messed up my words there. William Howard Taft slapped down the Democratic uh, nominee, William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan had been running for president since the Mayflower came over, and the guy not, never quite brought it together. As you can see by the electoral tally uh, there, um, President Taft shellacked uh, William Jennings Bryan. And so what is this? What's the deal with William Howard Taft? William Howard Taft, much like Teddy Roosevelt, had been a progressive with regard to racial incidents and, and situations and so forth. But early in his presidency, a number of things occurred regarding the Spanish-American War, what was left over from the Spanish-American War and our relationships in um, the Philippines and in Cuba and Puerto Rico that um, he kind of cowered a bit and started to do what Teddy Roosevelt did, which was to shrink from what had been hitherto a responsibility for black and brown people. And so you have in this political cartoon, you have Teddy Roosevelt fixing to ride off into the sunset, handing his policies to William Howard Taft. But one other thing happened. William Howard Taft, while Teddy Roosevelt had been um, retired, William Howard Taft put his arms around big business much more than Roosevelt would have ever imagined possible. And so this leads to all kinds of dissent and all kinds of problems and a terrible rift growing in the Republican Party. It's at this point that what we know now as the Great Migration begins. It originally was called the Great Northern drive. And great is an overstatement because it was kind of a trickle. Why was this going on? Because in the wake 
of the Reconstruction period. And as white Southerners felt their control over the Old South, obviously having completely slipped away, but their control over their old slaves slipping away, they doubled down as far as white terrorism and so forth was concerned on black people in the South. And so you had lynching just exploding all over the place. And we don't give, we don't pay enough attention to the horrors of lynching. And we don't really need to get into the specifics of the horrors of lynching. They don't teach this stuff in school, but to give you an idea of the reality of lynching, there is um, a short story by the great, the late great James Baldwin called The Outing. I believe it was The Outing. Um, it's in his book of short stories called Going to Meet the Man. You read that and you will understand the horrific circumstances and realities of lynching. So the terrorists in the South doubled down on killing and maiming and terrorizing and just intimidating black and brown people as a result of all of the apparent advances that had been spoken about uh, being made. 1912, we have all of this racial turmoil starting to percolate, and we have a trickle of African-American people heading north to get the hell away from all of this nonsense. And oh, by the way, every four years, like clockwork, we have a presidential election. And this is one of the most important presidential elections, I think, of all time. 1912, the Republican convention in 1912 is in Chicago between the Auditorium Theater and the Congress Plaza Hotel, and there is the sitting president, William Howard Taft. And who shows up to spoil the party? His one-time pal and buddy and quasi-mentor, former president, Colonel Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt is spitting fire. He is some kind of upset at the, the state of American affairs in general, but specifically how his office, the Oval Office, and, you know, no president wants to give up being president. None of them want to go. Even Nixon didn't want to go. Teddy Roosevelt is not liking what's going on. So he shows up in Chicago and says, hey, how you doing, everybody? And in the middle of the Republican convention, he decides, I'm leaving the party. And he starts a progressive party, it, literally in the middle of the Congress Plaza Hotel. He marches a whole bunch of delegates that have pledged their loyalty to him across the street to the auditorium theater, tearing the Republican Party asunder, leaving easy pickings for the Democratic candidate, who we'll get to just now. His name was Woodrow Wilson, and Woodrow Wilson was a Dixiecrat in the worst possible way. Woodrow Wilson was a product in so many ways of the South. Woodrow Wilson, in so many ways, had no use for non-white people at all, at all. However, in order to get elected president, he sees and smells blood in the water, and so he makes all kinds of promises. Hello out there, my fellow Americans. I'm the face of the new Democratic Party. Forget the fact that we Dixocrats and Democrats from the South have been trying to string you up from trees all over the place. Forget the fact that the Republican Party still has people who remember and adored Abraham Lincoln and want everything stemming from abolitionism to continue. I'm the face of the new Democratic Party, and I have your best interests in mind. Please vote for me. I'm Woodrow Wilson. Well, Woodrow Wilson um, was a lucky sum gone because that would have been a much, much closer election had Teddy Roosevelt not stepped in or if Howard, when Howard Taft had stepped out, it would have been a Republican landslide. However, with the Republican Party torn apart, Woodrow Wilson wins the presidency. And so we're moving into March of 1913 with a brand new president who is all smiles at his inauguration. And back in those days, inauguration day was March 4th, not January 20th. So this is Chicago's birthday that inauguration day used to be on. Woodrow Wilson is not only happy, he's like, hey, I'm everybody's president. I'm the new face of the Democratic Party. He invites Booker T. Washington to participate in the inauguration. Wow. 
And then he catches so much hell for this. He says, all right, we need to put, and pardon my language here, we need to put the window dressing house Negro away because then the real Woodrow Wilson comes out. Like all of his predecessors, he does not acknowledge that there is a problem with terrorism in rural and Southern states. He does not acknowledge that there is a problem with lynching and he in no way wants to step in and make a comment a word of support with regard to, to the lives of black and brown people, much less the rights of black and brown people. So he's all smiles because there's a new sheriff in town. Meanwhile, overseas, the new president of the United States steps into a growing quagmire unwittingly. He becomes president thinking, yeah, we're gonna be, we're gonna be a domestic party situation up in here. And let the record show, ladies and gentlemen, that every president we've ever had who said, yeah, we're going to take care of all of our domestic stuff. I'm going to be known as a domestic oriented president of the United States almost always winds up being known and legendary and infamous for having been a foreign policy oriented president. They, that's not how they want it. So be careful of what you ask for. So while all of the racial tension is starting to boil a little bit. We have Europe. We have an incredibly complex series of alliances and treaties, traditional friendships and so forth that is uh, going to make the problems that we have here domestically look like, um, I don't know, a polo match. We have all kinds of alliances going on and the tensions are growing. We just hope that there is not some kind of spark to set off war. But as war in Europe appears to be inevitable, the president says, well, you know what? This is their problem over there. We're going to double down on being more insular. The United States wants nothing to do when it comes to wars with other European-oriented white nations unless there's something in it for us. This is the traditional platform of the United States. And so Prior to this, during the Industrial Revolution and during the Gilded Age, we had a stream, a couple of streams of immigrants coming in to run the American economic machine. You needed bodies, you needed blood, you needed sweat, you needed grit, and you needed people who were going to settle for any kind of job. And so the immigrant pool was perfect, the oil, if you will, for this machine in America. Well, as war inevitably approaches in Europe, the immigrant pool starts to dry up. Oh, my goodness gracious, we need these factories to be staffed. So what do northern companies do? Northern companies know that the most important c color in the United States is not black nor brown, nor white. It is green. And so northern companies, especially in Chicago, start to raid the South, looking for workers. Hey, you, come on over here. Listen, how much did you make working this farm last year? 20 bucks. Wow. You know what? If you come up to Chicago, I can guarantee that you'll make uh, probably close to $20 a week sometimes play your cards right stick with me and of course this rating of the south includes that most um that greatest number of workers in the south african americans or rural african americans and so president wilson is in the office now and just as i had alluded to a few moments ago he starts to renege on all of these concessions and all of these promises that he had made during the campaign. Yeah, the new face of the Democratic Party. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. I'm an old pal of Pete Townsend, so he doesn't mind me using his lyrics. Yeah, so he starts reneging on anything and he starts surrounding himself with fellow Dixocrats and elevating them. For example, we have Josephus Daniels here. Josephus Daniels was one of the most um, vicious and died in the wool Dixocrats of the early part of the 20th century. This gentleman was, I lose that, use that term loosely, this gentleman was made the Secretary of the Navy, and he ran a very taut ship. In fact, this is where we get the term Cup of Joe, because he would not allow anything stronger than coffee to be drunk in this man's Navy. Josephus Daniels typified the kind of Dixocrats that came into power and were elevated 
<clears throat> within the ranks under President uh, Woodrow Wilson in his first term. And these guys, this cabal got together and not even quietly tried to repeal the 15th Amendment. What's the 15th Amendment? The 15th Amendment gave African Americans the right to vote in this country. My goodness gracious, it's barely 50 years since the end of the Civil War, and we have Dixocrats trying to strip away these rights that we had earned after 250 years of slavery. So this is what Woodrow Wilson is up to. And so what happens as a result of this? The terrorists in the South are emboldened, as bullies always are when they see that no one is going to confront them as far as their inappropriate and, and frankly, immoral efforts and actions are concerned. They've doubled down and do more. Lynching went up and up and up and up and up. And the fact that, ladies and gentlemen, when cameras weren't even commonplace in the American experience, that we have so many pictures of groups of people having lynched people, burnt people up, um, torn people apart, like drawing and quartering with cars and so forth, that people proudly posed for photographs with the work that they did speak so much to the lack of value of black and brown people in this country at the time of our narrative. And so these people are going on. Another thing comes in, oh, bang, right in the middle of our domestic narrative, international stuff intervenes and upstages us. The shot heard round the world, and I'm not talking about Bobby Thompson's home run in the playoffs between the Giants and the Dodgers in 1951. Of course, we're talking about the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, Franz Ferdinand, which ticks off, ticks off, it ticks off a bunch of people and it sparks the beginning of the Great War, the war to end all wars. <laughs> we'll see about that. And of course, World War I. And so President Wilson is faced with an unprecedented juggling act that no commander in chief before ever had to deal with. We've had a few who've had to do some pretty good uh, sleight of hand maneuvers and juggling acts, but President Wilson was in uncharted territory because there are all kinds of things to consider now. He has our weird, 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 awkward history with Great Britain. Because now that World War I has begun, it looks like if we're going to come into this thing at some point, or at least aid and sucker aside, it's going to be the side whose anchor is Great Britain. And traditionally, we can't stand Great Britain. We, we left their damn country, and they came, to, they came back and burnt down the White House and other parts of Washington in 1812. What the heck is going on here? Oh, and then our second big wave of immigrants, Irish. You might have heard this, and if I'm saying something that's shocking you right now, I apologize. Britain and Ireland, really, really, really bad history. So how are we going to ask Irish Americans to fight on the side of Britain? This is awful, something for him to deal with. Oh, and by the way, France and Britain had been at war with one another on and off for about a thousand years, and they're going to be allies in this thing for, I believe, the first time in human history. Oh. Britain, while well, they're in the middle of all of this stuff, they have an awkward uh, history with Germany due to the various alliances and marriages and all of this weird stuff going back to the days of, brace yourself, Henry VIII. Now, anytime Henry VIII gets in involved in a conversation that does not involve um, Anne Boleyn and people getting their heads chopped off, you know you got a situation going on. Oh, and look at this. Guess what? I'm not sure if you knew this, but the United States has had an awkward history with Mexico and countries south of the Rio Grande in Central America and South America. And it looks like Germany might get involved in this bad boy, too, because of its alliances. So the United States under Woodrow Wilson claims that it wants nothing to do with a war abroad in Europe. But at the same time, it is trying very hard to interfere with and dictate policy in Latin America. Hypocrisy, right? And so more questions for Woodrow Wilson with regard to international policy versus domestic policy and all of these moving parts going on. And he's always got to be thinking about 
midterm elections and eventually he's going to be up for re-election. And so this growing fire gets a whole, the, the growing domestic fire gets a whole gallon of gasoline thrown on it when D.W. Griffith uh, releases his cinematic masterpiece, as many people who are film students will say. D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation was guaranteed to inflame and fan the, the, the fires of racial hatred and racial intolerance in the South, moreover, and to glorify the old South and the days of the Ku Klux Klan. The African-American community begged President Wilson, please, Mr. President, we know you're a Dixiecrat, but this is going to set us back even farther than you have, unless, of course, you want that. Well, not only did uh, President Roosevelt screen the picture in the White House and saw nothing objectionable to it, he allowed it to, he gave it his endorsement when it was what was released. And so the African-American population, we see because, wow, the one good thing we can say about Woodrow Wilson is, boy, he was lying before, but he's honest as a son of a gun right now. And so the pressure gets turned up. The heat gets turned up domestically on Woodrow Wilson because of his indifference or unwillingness as far as being champions of or friends of African-Americans. Oh, oh, and then another event happens. The leader of the Voices of Prudence, the leader of the tectonic speed of change when it comes to the Black experience, Booker T. Washington dies and no one rises up straight away to take his place as far as um, a peaceful, thoughtful, deliberate leader of the Black movement. And so this unifies the voices of the African-American experience a little bit more. And then we have all kinds of evidence popping up here and there throughout the early part of Woodrow Wilson's first term that affirm what Blacks are saying the whole time. 1915, we have the Galveston tornado slash hurricane slash flood which destroyed the whole town. This is a young man. Well, this is a little boy who was sitting in the damage there in Galveston. So this, this little boy presumably grew to be a man and has been dead for a very long time. Well, the good citizens of the great state of Texas, specifically Galveston, impressed African-Americans from all over the region without pay to come in and be forcibly made to repair the damage, clean up and repair the damage in Galveston. Impressment is just another slick $9 college word for slavery. And see, this is what happened when we have this kind of sentiment being emboldened. And so all of this is going on and we have General, General Sherman marched, cut a, cut a path through the deep south in the, the latter days of the Civil War, effectively ending the old south. In 19 and 16, a plague set upon the south, the bull weevil arrives in the South in about 1916 and destroys what is left of a lot of the cash crops in the South. And so what do the terrorists do in the South? They squeeze the black farmers who are still there, the ones that they don't kill. So the perfect storm is brewing as far as a great, great movement. In 19 and 14, there are 1.2 million European immigrants. Wow, one year later, only 300K. Somebody's got to work in those factories. And so Northern companies not only continue to raid the South, but this is so important. The unions, especially in Chicago and Detroit and St. Louis, the unions begin to accept African-Americans as members. We saw a little bit of this in the Gilded Age in New York City, but not nearly in the numbers that we find during what is the Great Northern Drive. This is really something. Wow. Union membership means a certain amount of protection with, with regard to a wage and working conditions and stability. And so the people who are in the North start telling all of their kinfolk down South, hey, we got room. Come on up. Wow. So Woodrow Wilson is still doing his juggling act. He ignores lynching 
won't even acknowledge that lynching goes on in this country. But he sends American troops after Pancho Villa during the American Revolution. So he has no problem with intervening, interfering in what should be a sovereign dispute going on south of the Rio Grande in the, the how the, the self-determination of the country of Mexico. But he ignores what's going on here with American citizens in his own country. Goodness gracious. So Germany says, you know what? Woodrow Wilson, we got this cat on the ropes with regard to roughly 10% of the population there of the United States. Germany tries a secret alliance with Mexico. And then it also tries with Mexico and on its own to recruit African American troops to, to spread propaganda, anti-American propaganda and the like through African American neighborhoods. I'm not making this up. This is all going on while Woodrow Wilson is dealing with this growing problem in Europe. An estimated million and a half jobs open in the North. Hey, we're hiring up here. Come on up North. Oh my goodness gracious. So the Chicago Defender says, you know what? It is time to up the ante when it comes to the Great Northern Drive. So it's essentially, my friends, daily in the Chicago Defender, you've got editorials, you've got articles, you've got opinion columns saying, hey, Stick everything that, that is precious to you in your best suitcase, put on your best suit, and catch the next thing smoking up north. And it is at this point, my friends, that the Great Migration truly, truly begins in earnest during the fighting of the First World War. Ah, but the Chicago Defender is not the only periodical, not the only newspaper that is giving voice to this, this growing sentiment in the African-American experience. Newspapers and so forth, editorials, concerts. It was very typical to go to a concert and in between acts, somebody would come out and say, hey, I am so-and-so from such and such business here on the south side of Chicago. Tell your people back home to come on up. We got jobs for them and so forth. And so word of mouth is still one of the best ways to spread uh, news. And then, ba, 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 the shot heard around the United States. We don't know for sure if it was torpedoes. We don't know if it was bombing. We don't know if the United States rigged this. And anytime we get into a war where there's some nebulous circumstances going on and some suspicion. There's always suspicion that the United States actually had a hand in staging the attack to use it as a means by which to go into war. However it got in there, the Lusitania was sunk. And this is after all kinds of warnings from Germany. Hey, don't get on a boat. Don't get on a ship. Don't cross the Atlantic Ocean because we're, we're shooting down everything. And indeed, ladies and gentlemen, it, there's more than a little evidence that, that suggests that the Lusitania had uh, war armaments and so forth running between Britain and the United States on it, as well as a bunch of other ocean liners. And so if you're looking at it from the German point of view, they did what they had to do. Nevertheless, the bottom line is the United States is now in this great war. And a lot of people near uh, President Wilson said sometimes he seemed troubled, other times he seemed exhilarated. We'll never know. So once this war begins, a new voice is, ridden, is risen in the African-American experience, and this is the scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, and he writes in a paper called Close Ranks, he calls for African-Americans to close ranks with our white cousins and brothers and sisters here in the United States. A suspension of the protest until after the war, to which the vast majority of the black community says, hell no. We're not fighting this man's war. We love this country, but we got to get what is ours. OK, so this is what is going on now. So there is not this still there's this lack of unity with the black voice, more conflict. Meanwhile. Though African-Americans, some who want to fight, others who don't, a series of propaganda films are made suggesting that 
every African American is ready to pitch in and help with the war effort. And they're all training very hard. And we have our colored fighters, United States historical film and all of this. And it's propaganda that the country is playing for everybody else and around the world just to assure them, yeah, we got everything's cool. We're in this now, we're all together, which was complete and other stuff. How do we know this? Because at that same time, Mexico begins to actively try to recruit African-American soldiers. So if we were unifi unified in our voice, no Mexican uh, recruiting agents would come over here and try to scoop up black troops and have them fight on the side of Germany. All very, very interesting. So now that the United States has entered the war, our African-American troops are ready, training, ready to fight, but they're not sent to fight, nor the officers, the few officers that there were percentage-wise percentage -wise, were allowed to lead. So they just sat around in uniforms waiting for some action because, my friends, this gets us to another question within the African-American experience. Pride. How does one, a person like me, how do I, a person like my father, a person like my mother, a person like everybody that I've been related to and all of my friends who've been African-American, how do we exhibit pride in our race and our country at the same time? How do we, who are so inclined, take pride in our race, but at the same time be good soldiers? Good soldiers walking tall, standing tall, fighting for the land we love without being called Uncle Tom by the more dissonant voices. It's a problem. It's always been a problem and it probably always will be a problem. But this is more of the conflict that is swirling in this crucible that is ultimately gonna push this country against its will into the next century, deep into it. And so, oh, back to President Woodrow Wilson. My man has a myriad of problems going on. If you've not been keeping score at home, let's let's review this. So most Americans want nothing to do with this war. They know that this whole situation in Europe is a freak show with regard to the alliances and so forth. This country has claimed that it is insular from the very beginning, since before this country became a country. But that's not true. This country is insular, tries to be insular when it comes to other white nations in Europe. When it comes to nations of black and brown people and land that this country, which was now a world power, had then become a world power, when this country smells a little of that blood, oh yeah, they want in. So most Americans want nothing to do with this war because there's nothing to gain. What's in it for me? Absolutely jack squat. Also on um, Woodrow Wilson's plate, acknowledging Jim, Grow, Jim Crow, much less dealing with it and the rights of black and brown people, he considers a distraction because he doesn't want to deal with this domestic stuff now because it's all about the war. Oh, and hello, welcome to the party, the suffragettes, and welcome with apologies to David Bowie, welcome to Suffragette City. The suffragette movement has been growing for some 10 years or more, and people are picketing all over the place. Hey, Mr. President. Hey, 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 ho, ho, ho. Mr. Wilson has got to go. Hey, 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 what if Mr. Wilson, what are you going to do today? So President Wilson has domestic stuff still, as well as the international stuff. So by the time the United States enters the First World War, nearly half a million African-Americans migrate to the North in the time that we are involved with World War I. And that's the final quarter, the last third of World War I, we show up and kind of you know, mop up the mess that was already going there. Tension obviously is extremely high, but from this tension, as we start to inevitably move towards the end of this war, there's a new beginning, and not just from the from the standpoint of there's always a new beginning when a war's over. It's a whole new society. So on July, in July of 19 and 17, after America has been in the war for a season, we have a silent march in New York City. This is what people are thinking of the closed ranks thing. 
We have a march, a parade of African-American protesters marching through the streets of Manhattan, not saying a word as a means by which to protest the black Holocaust and the black, the, 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 the terrorism that African-Americans were experiencing driving half a million people to the North. And so it's at this point, excuse me, that finally, 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 African-American troops are gonna be given an opportunity, if not to fight, at least to go overseas and we'll see what's going on. And one of the first uh, regiments to be deployed is Chicago's 8th Regiment. This is them scrambling together and marching Look at these guys walking tall, leaving for Europe, and they are treated as heroes as they're on their way. And so this would, it would appear, speak to dissension in the ranks of the white power structure. Here we have African-American troops who haven't even done anything yet, and they're being treated as heroes. Hmm, I wonder what's happening. Oh, my gosh, President Wilson, what is your problem now? He's got more problems. Oh. What? Are you a little sensitive? Are you a little sensitive over all this criticism you're getting, President Wilson? Oh my gosh, what are you going to do about it? I'll tell you, Clarence, what I'm going to do about it. The Espionage Act of 1917, prohibiting spying, interfering with the military draft, making false statements that might impede military success. The Sedition Act of 1918, forbidding Americans to use disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language regarding the United States government, flag, or armed forces during times of war. And the act, a little PS, the act also allows the Postmaster General to deny mail delivery to dissenters of the government policy during wartime. This is extraordinary. However, it is not without precedent. You history buffs out there, you know this is very, very similar to the Alien and Sedition Acts of a hundred years and change before. I would be under the jail if things like this were still going on, and we tried to do them again during the war on terrorism in the early part of this century, if you will recall. So, President Wilson's going to shut everybody up and get to work. That doesn't work in the United States. And so President Wilson on, on Thanksgiving Day finds the protest has come to him. It's like, hey, President Wilson, I'm dressed like a pilgrim and the turkey is you. I want you to put me in jail. I want you to arrest a whole bunch of people who are protesting in front of the White House. Well, President Wilson has got a whole lot on his plate and he's still trying to silence the black community. But as we all know, silent voices are often the loudest. And so Wilson learns, and more and more information comes out about this every year, that during World War I, in their attempts to recruit African Americans to turn against their own country, German intelligence experts concluded that, quote, no amount of propaganda could do so. However, the American government's indifference to the problem and concerns of its own citizens might achieve the same result. Meaning that if the war had lasted longer, Germany might have gotten what they wanted from the United States rather than by their own hands. This is extraordinary. And then in 1917, an angel appears on Woodrow Wilson's shoulder. Or is it the voice of pragmatism? Or is it the voice of political expediency? Or is it the voice of, I'm tired of fighting? We've all been there. And so for the first time in his illustrious career, Woodrow Wilson makes a statement coming out against lynching. And indeed, my friends, Woodrow Wilson, the Dixocrat, is the first president ever to make any statement against the horrors of lynching and the way that we were terrorized in the South and in rural areas in the North and in the West in the early part of the 20th century. And let the record show that almost all of his successors rarely spoke out in support and defense of African-Americans until they were forced to. So Woodrow Wilson makes this proclamation and because I think he wants to get on with the war. 
he wants to finish up this war because now there are black troops being deployed. And so Woodrow Wilson, yes, sir, he says, I'm going to unify those African-Americans behind me if it's the last thing I do. He comes and he makes a statement about lynching, saying, like, OK, I got everybody lined up. And then he comes out with this 14 point plan for peace that he is offering to Germany. And he's waiting for the German response, but he gets a response from the African-American community saying, hey, Mr. President, we might love this country and we might want to fight for this country, but we have a response to your 14 points that you're not going to like. We got our own 14 points that include making lynching a federal offense, allowing African-American women to be in the Red Cross, allowing African-Americans to be in the Navy beyond more than just a cabin boy or something, and desegregating the military amongst a bunch of other points that the African-American community submitted to the president. Man, Wilson is, he's got to be so frustrated and it's so very typical of presidents of the United States prior to 19 and hmm, 2000 and hmm, actually it's very typical of presidents of the United States to grumble about a group, <clears throat> any group. They're so ungrateful. Don't they appreciate what I've done for them, implying that freedom and equality and equity and justice come from the generosity of the state or by the head of state and not from the hand of God. That being said, the 8th Infantry is renamed the 370th Infantry Regiment placed under French control. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. They are off for some guerre and they are, are there for some bruit, but they find out, wow, they get to France. All of these Yank troops, who most of them have never left the States, and there's a language barrier. Oi. And then there's all kinds of cultural differences. Oi. The equipment is different. Oi. Oh, my gosh. And we're Americans. We like to eat. Can you imagine a bunch of young soldiers used to American grub, GI grub, being handed a croissant and a little fruit? And so here you go, bud, that's supper. This is not supper. This is an hors d'oeuvre. All of these things. And then the African-American troops got the idea, wait a minute, we are being set up to fail. We're always being set up to fail. Oftentimes a pioneer in a particular, a, a pioneer in a particular job or something like that, or a trailblazer will be set up to fail. So the powers that be can say, see, this is why we never gave you a chance in the first place. And so what happened? They thrived, they thrived. And to an individual, all of the European countries and all of the European servicemen and service women and the like who had the pleasure of working with any of the African-American troops during the First World War said they had never seen such exemplary soldiers and they made a lasting impression. But that impression street is a two-way street because these African-Americans, many of them who had never seen beyond their own small towns where Jim Crow was rampant and then unspoken Jim Crow like we had up here in the North and still have up here in the North to a certain extent, they get over there and they see the relative harmony and the relative acceptance in Europe. The countries that invented colonialism, the countries that in a large way invented slavery and championed it around the globe are really on a fast track to change. And ultimately, like the song says, how you gonna keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? They come back to the United States after the war, not only having kicked butts and taken names, but there's a whole brave new world out there. And so they come back to America from the war, bringing a view of the future to push aside the present and certainly push out of the picture completely the past. And meanwhile, Woodrow Wilson has his hands tied because this vision of peace in the post-war <clears throat> world requires the United States. And this is where the United States uh, hypocrisy when it comes to being insular gets them into trouble because this vision of a League of Nations ain't going nowhere 
without the United States. And so the United States never ratifies participation in the League of Nations, and it goes up like a house of cards, like a castle of sand very, very quickly. And we know 20 years later what happened. Woodrow Wilson has been aged frightfully so, and of course suffers a stroke in his second term. I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised actually, when you consider that all of the stress that this guy was dealing with and politicians, especially ones who have an enormous amount of responsibility are notorious for not taking care of themselves because they're trying to take care of the country. And so what we have back in the United States, we have a new African American experience blooming. But then by the same token, we have the reactionary voices from the past that still want to rain terror down on African Americans as a result of the progress that has seemingly been made. And this manifests itself in the red summer of 19 and 19, race rioting all over the country, one of the worst ones in Chicago, U.S. of A. But ultimately, no matter how much blood is spilled, no matter how many people are maimed and killed, no matter how many seismic changes are there where there's an attempt to ignore them and ignore the changes that are on the horizon that are so inexorable, the changes are going to come and they're going to be, there's going to be progress in every walk of life in this country of ours. Because in the final analysis, my friends, the disparity and the diversity of our collective American voices is key. And it is one of our common threads, despite the dissimilarities. And this is yet another instance in which the internal subgroups, not part of, nor represented by the government, influence policy. In short, voices, great and small, strong and weak, voluminous and meager, are all equal parts of our shared American narrative. If you have enjoyed this, or if you want to keep in avoiding me, my Facebook page is facebook.com slash music and Chicago stuff. My website is clarencegoodman.wixsite.com slash Clarence Goodman. If you want a copy of my book, I know a guy who can hook you up with one. Write me and I'll tell you how to get in touch with him. Uh, words of thanks to uh, Leighton and Ivan who uh, booked the show but is uh, not with us this evening enjoying a snow day as it were and for all of the patrons and pals of the Stickney Forest View Public Library like yourselves out there. God bless you, God keep you, and keep on rocking your local library. Back to you Leighton. Thanks so much Clarence. Um, so we do have, uh, we've got Barbara joining us on the Zoom call. If you have any questions, if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, feel free. Uh, we also have some uh, people tuned in on Facebook. Um, we, uh, we have a comment from one of our Facebook viewers who wrote, love it, so informative. Um, if anyone has any questions for Clarence, you can type them in the, the Facebook comments or uh, Barbara, if you want to type it into the chat box on Zoom or if you want to unmute yourself if you have a microphone. Um, either of those options work. Or a very um, loud voice if she doesn't have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that was a very, uh, very informative and interesting program. Thank you so much, Clarence. Thank you. Thank you. Is Barbara going to, uh, Miss Hill, are you going to join us? Have I scared you away, Miss Hill? <laughs> So it looks like we don't have any questions uh, from, our, from our audience. Um, thank you all for, for joining us, uh, Diana and uh, Barbara and everyone else who's been tuning in. Um, thank you again for joining us, Clarence. Um, we, uh, I just sent a, a newsletter out today also. We have a, a great art exhibit going on in the library, um, also um, to tie in with Black History Month. Um, it's all about, um, it's called, um, let me pull up. That's called again here. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. It's uh, Telling People Stories, uh, African-American Children's Illustrated Literature. It's an art exhibit um, in the main room of the library uh, showcasing illustrations from uh, about 30 different uh, children's books, 120 different images um, from 33 different artists. So please feel free to stop in the library and take a look at that as well. Once and, it's uh, shoveled, right? 
once the walkway is shoveled and off of that, right? <laughs> once the walkway is shoveled, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that might that might be me out there tomorrow morning doing that. So we'll we'll have to see. I'd offer to help you, but I'm going to be shoveling this this stuff here myself. So uh, <laughs> Godspeed, and uh, don't forget to take. You know, actually, uh, if you have if you have one second, Clarence, I just yes. That Diana Diana wrote. Um, I wanted to more. I wanted to know more about the African American experience during the Mexican independence. Did you have anything you'd uh, add to that? Well, what I know about that is that um, the African, or excuse me, Mexican agents were not so much trying to infiltrate the ranks here in America and the African American experience, but basically were coming over the border and going to towns and saying, hey, would you like a job? Would you like to be a mercenary? So uh, effectively, you had uh, Mexican agents coming into the larger cities and then some southern places too, recruiting mercenaries because they saw how badly the African-American experience was and how badly African-Americans we were being treated here. And, um, it, you know, they're just trying anything because they were fighting for their independence. And then, of course, they had their alliance with Germany. And it was um, it was all a big mess. And nobody can remember why the First World War started. <laughs> like that Bob Dylan song goes, can somebody please tell me what we were fighting for, you know? But we had God on our side, right? There you go. There you go. Um, do you have any, if you have any additional uh, questions, Diana, feel free to type them um, or uh, use well, Barbara. Um, otherwise, um, we might be wrapping this up here in a minute. Oh, Diana, Diana just wrote, thank you and love your music inserts also. <laughs> 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 So. Well, oh, well, so what, then let me give a plug. Um, Sunday afternoon at two o'clock, I'm doing a virtual concert for uh, what library is that? Uh, the Helen Plum Library in Lombard, uh, an unfinished journey, um, African American music during the pivotal decades of the 20th century. It's a concert. Oh. So you should, if you, if you like the music, you should hear me with my guitar and ukulele. You said that Sunday at two? Yes, yes. Okay, that Helen Plum. Okay, very good. Helen Plum, yeah, it's a, it's a virtual show. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, fantastic. Okay, well, then I think we're all set then. Um, thank you, everyone who's tuned in to the program tonight, and thank you again, Clarence. And, thank you. Uh, stay, stay warm and be safe when you're out there shoveling. <laughs> you too. Give my regards to Ivan and everybody else on your staff. I definitely will. Thank you very all much. Right, man. Take it easy, yep, everybody. Good Bye. night. Good night, everybody. If you enjoyed this video, please like the video and subscribe to the Stickney Force View Public Library's YouTube channel. Also, like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Stickney Forest View Public Library District, where great things happen.